Pokemon games aren't known for their difficulty, but of the over 100 Pokemon games in existence, a select few are known to give players some problems. Games like Pokemon Coliseum and Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Time are notorious for having extremely difficult portions and levels, but what if I told you the hardest game mode ever made in Pokemon is one that you didn't even know existed? In Pokemon Stadium for the Nintendo 64, there's a game mode called Kids Club, and if you've ever played Kids Club, you know that you can play the game on easy, medium, and hard difficulty. But what you might not know is there's a secret difficulty called Hyper Mode, which cranks the difficulty an insane amount, with some of the levels actually becoming impossible. But before we talk about the unfairness that is Hyper Mode, let's first talk about how we can unlock it. In order to unlock Hyper Difficulty, you have to win five games in a row in the Who's the Best Game Mode, with three computers all set to hard difficulty. And the way the Who's the Best game mode works is that you and three computers continuously play from a set of three mini games until one player has won nine times total, with the player with the least wins choosing the mini game each round. And each of those mini games comes with a very distinct challenge requiring an equally distinct skill set. The first mini game is Magikarp Splash, which is very simple. All we have to do is make Magikarp jump into the counter at the top of the screen as many times as we can before the timer runs out. To make Magikarp jump high enough to hit the counter, we have to press and hold down A, and then when Magikarp is landing, we have to press and hold A again. This minigame all comes down to timing. If we don't hold down A long enough, Magikarp won't jump high enough to hit the button, and once Magikarp is falling, if we can time it right, we can cause Magikarp to instantly jump right upon landing, wasting no time on the ground whatsoever. But if we are too early or too late, Magikarp can just stall on the ground, wasting us a point. The next minigame is Clefairy Says, which tests our memorization skills. In each round of Clefairy Says, Clefairy will give us instructions that we must follow on the chalkboard, and once the instructions disappear, we just have to recite the movement back to the class. And after each round, the sequence will get longer, and with each incorrect input, we will get bonked by this little squeaky hammer. And the game ends once the final sequence has been recited, or once three of the four players have been bonked all the way to zero. The third minigame is Run Rattata Run, which is basically a how fast can you press the A button minigame with a little bit of timing involved. In this game, we play as a Rattata on a treadmill, and once the timer starts, we just have to press A as fast as possible, and whenever a hurdle shows up, we just jump over it with the arrow pad. Every player's track is the exact same, but the track itself changes every round, and the first player to reach the finish line is considered the winner. The next minigame is Snore War, which is all about timing and a little bit of rhythm. In this game, all four players play as a Drowsy, and they stand in a circle surrounding a pendulum. Once the game starts, the pendulum will start to swing, and every time the pendulum reaches the needle at the center of the arc, we just have to press the A button. This game starts out fairly easy, but as the game goes on, the pendulum starts to swing faster and faster, and basically every time we miss the needle, your drowsy will get a little bit sleepier, and after missing enough, will eventually fall asleep, knocking us out of the game. The next game is Thundering Dynamo, which is once again just a how fast can you press the button with a bit of a twist. In this game, you're given either a blue or a green light, which corresponds with the A and B button on the Nintendo 64 controller, and whenever that light is showing, we just have to press the corresponding button as fast as we can in order to build our charge meter. And the reason that we can't just hit both as fast as possible, if we hit the wrong one, our charge meter will go down. So after the colors alternate a couple of times, whoever fills their charge meter completely first is the winner of the minigame. The next minigame is Sushi Go Round, which is probably the most intricate and the most enjoyable of the minigames, in my opinion. But in Sushi Go Round, we play as Lickitung in a gluttonous rampage to eat as much sushi as we possibly can. In this game, there are eight distinct types of sushi, each with different prices. And once the game starts, if we eat a piece of sushi, we will make money based on how much it costs. But just eating the most expensive sushi isn't the only thing that matters. If we can combo two of the exact same type of sushi, we can get a combo, which will multiply by how much sushi is worth by the combo that we are on. If we can combo two of the exact same type of sushi together, we can get a combo which will multiply how much the sushi is worth by the combo that we are on. The combo will cap out at five and will reset whenever we eat a different type. But after a set amount of time, the sushi is tallied and whoever has the most money is the winner. The next game is Ekans Hoop Hurl, which requires us to sling Ekans onto Diglets in sort of a whack-a-mole type minigame. In this game, there are nine holes that the Diglets can pop up from, and once the Diglets pop up, if we can ring Ekans around one, we'll get one point. 
The only extra challenge is that every player has access to the same board. So if one player rings a Diglett before the other, then that Diglett will already be gone. And the only other thing is that towards the end of the game, shiny Diglets will start to pop up, which can give us double the points, so should always take priority. And the second to last of the mini games is called Rock Harden, which is only about timing. In this mini game, we play as either a Metapod or a Kakuna, and all we have to do is use Harden whenever a boulder that is shot into the sky is about to hit us. By using Harden, our life total will decrease slowly, but by getting struck by a boulder, our life total will decrease by a lot. So the main goal is to use Harden as quickly and as little as possible, all while never being hit by a boulder. And once there's only one person left alive, they become the winner. And that leaves us with the final and most important mini game of all, Dig Dig Dig. In this game, we play as Sandshrew, and all we have to do is alternately press the left and right bumpers as quickly as we can. And as long as we can do it at a reasonable rate, without pressing both bumpers at the same time, we can almost always get a win. And to why it's the most important mini game, let's talk about the best way to even unlock hyper difficulty. Also, just as a little PSA, I tried playing this on the new N64 Pass on the Switch, and the delay from the input to the emulator, while extremely small, makes all of these games just a tiny bit harder, which, with the already extremely small margin for error, made it almost unbearable to try and beat, so I swapped to the original hardware to give myself a better chance. But as I mentioned before, by winning five games in a row in the Who's the Best game mode, hyper difficulty can be unlocked. But winning five games in a row isn't exactly easy. If we win the first game of the tournament, our opponents get to pick the next game. And in this game, there are a couple that even on hard mode are extremely difficult to beat. Games like Run Rattata Run and Thundering Dynamo require us to press a specific button insanely fast. And for some people, including myself, it's practically impossible to press a button quicker than the computers in this game. And even games like Sushi Go Round or Ekans Hoop Hurl require extreme precision and sometimes just straight up luck as the high value sushi can spawn next to your opponents, or the golden diglets will be closer to the Ekans on the right side of the screen. So while winning five games in a row is doable, the easiest and most consistent method is to basically put ourselves six games behind third place, and then choose a game that we know we can win every single time, which for me is dig dig dig. The only difficult part of this strategy is we have to make sure that first place doesn't reach nine stars before third place reaches six. And since we will have zero stars the entire time, we can select sushi go round each time and just sabotage first place. We can shove them out of the way and steal all their sushi so we can hopefully even out the score. But once third place has six stars, we choose dig 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 five times in a row and after winning them all, hyper difficulty is unlocked. And in order to conquer hyper difficulty, we have to beat who's the best with the victory set at nine wins. And when they say hyper difficulty, do they put emphasis on the word hyper? Once turning the difficulty to hyper, six of the nine mini games instantly become insanely difficult. The first one, which is actually impossible, is Thundering Dynamo. Not only can the computers press buttons faster than even the button mash king, but they instantly swap their presses once the color changes. So the only possible way to win this game is to be able to click faster than this and to just guess when the colors are going to swap. Because if you accidentally press the wrong button just once, the computer is going to beat you. The next near impossible minigame is Sushi Go Round. In Sushi Go Round, there are three viable strategies to winning. The first one is to collect all of the highest priced sushi. The next is going for small combos of the medium priced sushi. Or lastly, you can go for extremely long combos of the cheap priced sushi. And the only reason this game is so hard on hyper mode is that each of the three opponents goes for one of these strategies. So whichever strategy you decide to go for, you're gonna be competing with another opponent. And then the other two are just gonna be free to go for the strategy that they want. So basically you have to go for one of the three strategies that you decide on and you have to beat your opponent to every single piece of sushi. And even if you can do that, you have a chance at beating the other two. So for our challenge of winning who's the best, only seven of the nine mini games are even possible at having a chance of getting first place. The next four I like to consider the somewhat maybe impossible mini games, which can be possible with enough practice, but require extreme precision. The first one is Magikarp Splash, which if we mess up just a single jump will instantly result in a loss and requires us to perform a handful of perfect splashes in order to have a chance at winning. The next one is Snore War, which we have to perfectly time the pendulum as it continuously gains speed, which even if we are perfect and don't miss a beat, will more than likely just end up in a draw, which will still give us a win, but it will also give a win to our opponent. 
The next of the near sometimes maybe impossible group is Run Rattata Run, which requires us to press as fast as Thundering Dynamo, but the only reason it is feasible is because instead of having to guess when the color is going to change, we just have to be able to time when to jump over the hurdle. And the last of the group is Ekans Hoop Pearl. And the best way to win this is to primarily focus on the Diglets that are on the left side of the screen, which are the ones closest to our Ekans. As the second the Diglet spawns, all of the opponents will instantly aim for the closest one to them, and they basically never miss. So the best strategy is to make sure we shoot for the Diglet the quickest, and after about halfway through, we try to time our throws around the shiny Diglets, as the computers will focus those first as well. So with the two actually impossible minigames and the four honorable mentions, that leaves us with three that we can consistently and should mainly focus on winning every chance we get, which are Dig Dig Dig, Clefairy Says, and Rock Harden. And if we lose only a couple of these games, we have no chance to reach nine wins before one of our opponents does. And that's not to say that these three minigames are easy, it's just to say that they're winnable. Even Dig 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 on Hyper Difficulty isn't a shoe win. It still requires us to alternate the bumpers extremely fast without ever overlapping the other one a single time. But at least these can be somewhat consistent. And to save you hours upon hours of blood, sweat, and mainly tears, here is how I finally beat the hardest Pokemon game ever made. The first mini game is completely random as everyone has zero wins. And luckily for us, it's Thundering Dynamo, which there's no hope of winning. But actually, luckily for us, we get the choice of the next mini game. So we select Dig 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 and press the left and right bumper like our life depends on. One other thing to note about the Kids Club is that whenever computers are selecting which mini game to play, they'll rotate through all of the mini games before selecting another one to play. So it's almost guaranteed that we will go through all nine mini games in a random order before replaying another one. So we can't just get lucky and hope to get Dig 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 nine times in a row. And on the flip side, we don't have to worry about getting Thundering Dynamo all the time. But the next winnable minigame for us is Rock Harden. And once getting the timing down for this one, it can be pretty consistent. As mentioned before, all we have to do is press Harden whenever we're about to get struck by a boulder. The only difficult thing is that the boulders are shot out of the sky at different heights, making them strike us at different times. But the best strategy I've found is to watch the shadows of the boulder. And you press Harden right as the shadow is about to reach us, and after a decent amount of practice, I could press Harden for a very short amount of time and almost always block the oncoming boulder. The next minigame is Run Rattata Run, and as this is one of the maybe winnable but probably not challenges, it's one of the ones that if I win, could give me a great chance of winning the whole thing. And as I mentioned before, you have to be able to press extremely fast. And even if you can at a reasonable pace, this is probably the third or fourth time that I've ever won this minigame out of probably the 100 plus attempts. And on top of that, I only beat second place by one frame, who only beat third place by one frame. So this was by far the best start to any of these tournaments that I could have asked for. The next minigame was Snore War, which was a ride off for me, but for someone with a really good rhythm or timing, might be one that could be consistent, but I just took the loss and went on to Clefairy Says. And Clefairy Says is one that's quite easy on the surface, but it can be pretty punishing. All we have to do is memorize the dance that the teacher tells us and recite it back to her. And as long as we never mess up, it's a guaranteed win. Even if the other player gets every step correct, we still get a star on the board. But if you mess up a single time, chances are you aren't gonna get the win. There are a few special things about this minigame, however. If your opponents also get a perfect score, that means they also get a star in the tournament, which makes it so that we are less likely to get more of our preferred minigames before our opponents can get to nine wins. So while it is out of our control, any minigames that end up in a draw are pretty bad for us. And another thing about this minigame is that if you have a horrible memory and can't seem to win this minigame at all, you can just take a picture of the board and recite it back with ease. But typically it isn't really that hard of a minigame and doesn't require the extreme measures. Another thing about these tournaments is that every one that I did, there always seemed to be one computer that was a little bit better than the rest. Like one computer would have three or four more stars than the other two, and I just had to hope that they would lose while on eight stars until there was a game that I could win. But that could just be a coincidence, or maybe it's on purpose. It's kind of like when you're playing Mario Kart against computers, and there's always that one that performs the best out of all of them. But either way, it tended to happen in just about all of my tournaments that I attempted, and this one it just happened to be the green, which after another round of mini games, I was tied with his six apiece. And with Sushi Go Round being the next game, I knew I had no chance of winning. So instead of trying my best, I decided to sabotage green so they couldn't get up to seven stars. And instead, I just tried to get red or yellow to win since they were further behind. And luckily after that, Dig 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 was next in the rotation. And now I was only two stars away. 
The next game was Thundering Dynamo, which I tried my best to guess the color changes, and as always, I just gave up and let the opponent take it. But luckily, Red got the win, allowing me to stay on top. And after that was Rock Harden, which I instantly started off with being smacked by one of the two boulders, trying to play as risky as possible. But I got my timing down and somehow managed to crawl my way back, getting my eighth star by the skin of my teeth. And then it was on to Run Rattata Run, which if you recall, I have like a 3% win rate on and can basically only win if I get really, really lucky and put my body on the line trying to mash that fast. But as I had a chance of winning it all, I gave it the best shot as I could. But just as before, only won by a single frame. And I only beat last place by just two frames, but I got my ninth win. And that's how I beat the hardest Pokemon game ever made. There are a couple of difficult Pokemon titles out there with varying skill sets required, but as some of these minigames can't actually be beaten in this, I think the Kids Club of Pokemon Stadium deserves a spot on the podium. Also, if anyone out there can actually beat Thundering Dynamo on hyper difficulty, please send me a video. I really don't think it's actually possible, but I would love to be proven wrong.